This is a production of Cornell University. So I, as David said, I'm, I'm uh, talking about uh, essentially the, what I find to be an interesting paradox in the, uh, in the, not just the U.S. society, but in, in global society, which is a paradox between what I think of as the, the veneration, the celebration of entrepreneurship, which uh, essentially makes a, an appeal to people to take on the role of entrepreneur and to take it on uh, as, a, as a desirable, feasible thing to do. But at the same time, we have the uh, data, since really the 1970s systematically collected, which, which shows us that this actually turns out to be something that not everybody's terribly good at. In fact, it turns out that most people seem not to be good at all. And so that sets up the paradox for this talk, which is that on the one side, what is sustained, what does sustain in the world the celebration of entrepreneurship, and what, what are the manifestations of that, and then why might it be, and here I'm going to be speculating, why might it be that uh, this celebration is not matched by a concomitant success story on the side of the enterprises that are actually created. And so that's, that's the premise of the presentation. And this is going to draw to some extent on work I've done, and to some extent it, it is speculative and um, hopefully controversial because I'm going to ask you some questions at the end. So I want you to pay close attention because there will be questions. So let me start with the, uh, the cultural veneration part to this. There's a lot of evidence uh, that people, not just in the United States, a lot of evidence that people around the world hold entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship in very high esteem. There are studies, uh, many global representative samples, multiple countries, 50 countries, 70 countries, the World Values Survey, the GEM Project, uh, surveys done by economists as well as public opinion re researchers, they all come to the same conclusion, which is when you ask people a question on the order of, uh, if you're given a choice between working for yourself and working for somebody else, which would you prefer? What do you think they say? The great majority in almost every country in the world say working on my own account, regardless of their current status. Right, this, and this, this holds um, pretty much even in societies where we know, if you look at the data on startups, the, the, the people aren't actualizing this, uh, this apparent state of desire. We also ask people in the GEM project, which is a global entrepreneurship monitor project, random samples now from about 45 countries, well, 60 countries this year. People are asked questions like, what's the status of entrepreneurs in your society? What, what do you think people, how do people feel about entrepreneurs, people or business owners, are they positive or negative? Again, uh, very positive, very positive evaluations. And even more striking, in, in the United States, we have surveys of youth asking them about their plans. So these are kids in their teens asking them, would you like someday to be, to have your own business? And the majority, 70, 80, 90 percent, depending on the survey year, say yes. And then we give them a test of economic literacy. Here's a hint of what's to come, those of you paying attention. We give them a test of economic literacy, 10 item test quest about things like ca what's cash flow, what's profit, why is it good, what's money, why is it good? So that's, a really, that's the first question. Uh, profitability, just basic questions about economic literacy, the way the economy works, and they fail miserably, these tests. That's generally true of American adults, but true particularly of children, kids. And nonetheless, here they have them responding by saying that someday, yes, it would be really nice if I had my own business. So you look a little more deeply, and then here's where the sociologist, institutional, cultural type person that's hiding inside me gets out. Uh, what, are the, what are some of the forces that might be sustaining this positive veneration, this, this, this uh, celebration? So I've listed here uh, educational institutions, governments, and the, uh, the media. I'll just say a few words about this because uh, you'll see it's pretty much self-evident what's going on. Uh, since the 1970s around the United States and around the world, business schools have created entrepreneurship tracks, 
than entrepreneurship chairs and entrepreneurship programs. Pretty much every business school, every modern business school has an entrepreneurship track. Uh, every, almost every modern business school has an endowed chair in entrepreneurship. And some of them, it's more than others. At Carolina, we have, we have actually an eight-course track in entrepreneurship. We have a launching the new venture. We have a, a multiple courses. And it's, it's not atypical for a, a business school. Now, that's at the, at the level of the postgraduate education. You look at undergraduate education, very much the same. What I find fascinating is that uh, people often think of the United States as somehow a global leader in entrepreneurship. Right? You probably have this impression if you read the media, you'd, you'd think that the U.S. must certainly be right on top of the pile. Uh, that's not the case. It's not the case either in startup rates uh, or in things like uh, entrepreneurship education. The Scandinavian countries have pushed entrepreneurship education right down to the level of a primary school. So in, in Sweden and Norway, their kids, kids in, in, in primary school, their kids actually taking courses where they're learning about the economy, learning about entrepreneurship. So in that sense, we're behind the, behind the times. So educational institutions uh, both are manifesting this interest, but also because of the things that they do, the activities that they are engaged in, they're also sustaining this interest. When it comes to uh, governments, uh, oh, you turned the light back on again. Actually, there was a reason for that. Okay. <laughs> I just realized what you've done. You washed out the beautiful graphics. They're going to get prettier as we go by. So. Is that right? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's good. Uh, starting in the 1970s, late 1970s, when David Birch began to write his pioneering series of papers and then a couple of books on the job generation process, he argued that modern economies, job markets, and, and offering of jobs depended upon, at the time he called them new small business. Basically, he focused on small businesses. We know now that that was a misguided uh, inference. The actual inference he should have made was new businesses, or new establishments and new firms. But he, he conflated the two, new and small. Now we know that was, that was not, not the thing he should have done. But as a result of that, uh, first in the UK and then in the EU, and then in, in many uh, Southeast Asian countries, governments began to, to sing the same song, which is that economic growth depends upon new businesses. And new businesses, because new businesses provide jobs for the population. And so that changed the game. But prior to that, uh, many Western European countries, not so much the United States, had industrial policies favoring established firms. The idea was to save jobs. How do you save jobs? You prop up big companies. And the new mantra after they birched, the message got through the OECD and the EU and others, um, it's about creating new firms. It's not EU has got all kinds of subsidy programs for different, different groups, immigrants, women, uh, you name it, there's a, there's a program somewhere. And the U.S. actually, again, lags behind the, the EU, certainly, in this. One last point about this. If you look at political discourse, this is really fascinating. Look at political discourse. And now in the U.S., it's, it's finally made, it's finally surfaced here because of what's been going on between the, the wings of the Republican Party. But um, look at the U.K., what, what the conservatives and now the liberal Democrats say about what government's role is. And you'll see the language of autonomy and responsibility on the part of the citizenry. Right? It's, it's, people's, it's people's responsibility to take care of themselves. You can say Margaret, Margaret Thatcher may have started this in, in the U.K., but... It's been continued, and now in, in the U.S. also underlying a lot of the political rhetoric. And if, I think if you see the connection between entrepreneurship and veneration of entrepreneurship and some of the language you've heard recently, you get a sense of this, that there, there's a sense among some people that government's role is essentially to help people, not to help people, is to get out of the way, make it possible for people to, to uh, somehow take charge of their own lives. And finally, uh, the last way that this is going on is the... Uh, the media, I, I'll show you in a second, or well, maybe I'll show you now, there's a graph. This is a uh, wonderful Google, what's it called, N, an n-gram, starting in 1900, running through 2008. And it's, it's, I searched on four terms. Uh, my, my big data colleague, Neil Karen, helped me with this. So, it's, uh, so the blue is small business, small businesses, variations, and the red is entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. And you can see, for much of well, this entire century, the entrepreneur labels enjoyed a slight advantage 
big jump in the late Depression years. Not surprising. But then you can see here, really, uh, beginning with the Reagan years, uh, actually before Reagan, really, but here, this, this sizable gap opened up there, where people stopped, when people talk, and the, when the media talks about what they used to call small business, now they'll use the term entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. Right. It's another sign. Yeah? Do you want to call if it's a short question, if it's a question I, of... I, I noticed that you did not use the word self-employment. Right. Yeah, self-employment is a labor market term. So that's the way I do it. I, I just use, it's, yeah. if, you, if I were talking about labor markets, I would use the term self-employment. But here I want to use a term that's more familiar to the people in business schools who don't tend to care about labor markets. Uh, not so much. Yeah. So, um, so, so you see this, this, this term has become popular. It's become, it's become popular. It's become uh, so, one more way. And you, if you go home tonight and look at, I even, I'm sure, the Ithaca Journal. Is that what it's called? The Ithaca Journal? I'm sure you'll find a story this week. Is it still published? Every day, probably not. Yep. Is? Okay, so look in the Ithaca. You'll see somewhere, sometime this this week, there'll be a there'll be an article on somewhere in mentioning uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. There's a wonderful paper which I haven't got much time to talk about, but there's a wonderful paper by um, let me just go back uh, by uh, a couple of French academics about three years ago. They took a, took about 200 French newspapers and looked at the way uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship were talked about. And they, it's, it's a really amazing bit of, uh, something like what Paul DiMaggio does with topic, topic sampling, but um, they show that the, me the French media, these articles, talked about entrepreneurship in a way that made it seem both desirable, it is something everybody ought to try to do, but also feasible. That's a critical word. That it wasn't just desirable to be an entrepreneur, it was also feasible that the average bloke could be an entrepreneur. So what are the consequences of this? Well, you see I listed up here uh, preliminary, we'll come back to this, but a couple of preliminary consequences, which is that uh, for whatever reason, and I'm, I'm not talking about first causes, I'm not, I can't actually tell you where this first idea came from, but it's clear it's a sustained idea and it's a growing idea. Many people want to be entrepreneurs. In the language that John Meyer would say, these people want to be the actor called an entrepreneur. Right? They're not, they may not know what it is exactly, as we'll see later, but they want to be entrepreneurs. And potentially, potentially this could be, could be leading to an oversupply, but we'll, we'll come back to that. More briefly, because this is again something, if you know my work or the work of uh, other oreocologists, um, one, of the, one of the things that I mentioned before, the surprising is this gap between the veneration on the one side, the celebration of entrepreneurship, and on the other side, the actual success rate for people attempting this. And so we know studies, constantly confirm this, we know there's a tremendous liability of newness for startups. That if you look at the, I'll, so, I'll show you a survival curve later, but basically you imagine this is the population of startups that is freshly minted, just getting off the ground businesses, and, and the survival curve looks something like this. It's incredibly steep. Uh, it's just very difficult to get through those years. Even when we do curves for businesses that are established and watch them over time, we see something sort of similar, not quite as, as steep as that. So, and that's true around the world. All, all the studies we've done everywhere pretty much show the, the same uh, phenomena. So one of the consequences of that, as I pointed out here, statistically speaking, if you combine the uh, lots of folks coming into this role trying to become entrepreneurs and you combine that with the high liability of newness and the more general fragility of businesses in all capitalist economies, you get a lot of churn. And that's one thing, when I see students in the, in the audience, I always make this point because your professors never told you this. Um, isn't that true? Mostly, never. I, I find that people don't know this. If you look at the economy, what you see, it looks like a placid economic environment. You see a lot of businesses. Now, if you walk down the commons downtown, you'll notice what I'm talking about. But uh, you know, you go out to the shopping malls, you can't see it quite as vividly as you do on the, on the mall downtown in the commons. But, the, you know, the underlying this placidity, there's a tremendous churn. There's constant coming and going of businesses. It's, and I'll, I'm going to give you some numbers to show you just what I'm talking about. Um, part of that is, going to, of course, going to involve financial loss. I've made a note here that it also involves, and some of my colleagues have studied this, substantial, sometimes socio-emotional costs as well. People who mortgaged their homes, sold their cars, uh, taking money out of their IRAs, you know, it's, there is a, a psychological and a, and a financial cost. Let me just show you, because this is my, this is the selling portion of the talk. 
because I never get a chance otherwise to do this with a captive audience. This is, this is to give you, uh, the point I'm going to be making this slide and the next slide is to give you some sense of how volatile the business population actually is. Orders of magnitude higher than any of you, I suspect, unless you've been studying this, would have recognized. This shows you in 2011 by quarter for establishments with employees. That's with employees. So uh, in, in any given year, for every business that starts with, that starts, that's registered at having an employee, uh, there's probably three started that don't have an employee. That's the typical number, about three to one. And these are births and deaths that is new to the world establishments. Some, but maybe half of those are created by existing uh, businesses. The other half are brand new, completely don't, aren't attached to another. And over, so I've shown you in this first, look, look at this first row. So this says in the first quarter of 2011, there were 189,000 establishments new to the world. And in that same quarter, 184,000 deaths, of, and not those necessarily, but 184,000 that, that went out of existence. And those 189,000, when they came into the world, brought with them 695,000 employees. And those 184,000, when they exited the world, closing down forever, uh, took with them 610,000. So this gives you some idea of what the stakes of the game are in Washington, D.C. when people talk about job creation and job, why people are so concerned about, about business creation and job creation. They're concerned about business creation because a lot of jobs are involved. And, it's, and you can see the difference between the, these numbers here is the, whether the game's being won or lost, so to speak, by, if you, if you thought about some, if there actually were somebody in charge, which there's not, if there were somebody in charge of the economy, what they'd be paying attention to is how big is that difference. So you can see, um, I, I used to show people, I, I won't do it, but if you look at earlier years, 2008, 2009, 2010, those were years in which the game was being lost. So the deaths column had more numbers than the births column, and the employees lost through deaths was bigger than the employees gained through births. And so it wasn't until, you can see here in that first quarter, that's a net gain in the first quarter of what is that, about 85,000 jobs. So you, you, you probably listen to the radio if you listen to a marketplace on NPR or listen to any of like the shows, uh, talk shows. You hear them talk about the, the jobs report. And the jobs report is the net jobs added to the economy. Well, where do those jobs come from? They're coming from a combination of new businesses and existing businesses expanding or, or contracting. So let me show you the next. This is 2012. I got more recent data for this. This, this is just from last month. This is all based on the Business Employment Dynamics database, which is uh, a database that uh, is in its, a marvelous resource. I don't think many people are aware of this yet. It's a, uh, you can't have access to it as a normal human being, but you could, if you sold your soul to the BLS, uh, you, you'd have access to it. So here, this, this is a more uh, expansive definition. So here in the first quarter of 2012, now openings includes uh, businesses that might have been temporarily shut down, and then seasonal businesses, and the same thing with the closings, they might be temporary. And over here, but now look at these numbers for expansions and contractions. These are, all these numbers show you, are showing you is the number of, of jobs. So uh, 1.2 million in the first quarter coming from establishments uh, opening up, 1.2 million business jobs gone, Expansions, almost 7 million jobs through expansions, but that's offset to some extent by almost 5 million jobs through contraction. So underlying the placidity of the economic, the surface of the economy, there's a lot of stuff going on. And a lot of that involves, a part of that involves businesses coming into being that didn't exist before. So that's why the, the stakes here are, are, are so high, and why uh, I, I take pains sometimes to point this out to people, that they just are not aware Every, every week, tens of thousands of these new, of, of the, in, the, in the economy, tens of thousands of people are starting businesses. And tens of thousands are closing businesses. And tens of thousands are opening, are, are expanding, and tens of thousands are closing. And it's the balance between those. Now you can see here in the fourth quarter, well, we were, actually, these, are, these numbers are pretty darn close, unfortunately. By the, by the last quarter of 2012, that's just, not, what, nine months ago, uh, we were positive here and positive here, but not, as you know, if you've been following the unemployment rate, still not enough positive to, you know, get us past 7 point, what is it, 7.2 percent? Okay, so back to the, to the talk. Uh, 
So again, remember, we got this contrast between the, the, the population of people hearing the message, living the message, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. It's good to be a, to start your own business. It's good to be to be self-employed if you wish. And we have at the same time the data I've shown you here, and the data from liability nudists, which I haven't shown you, but you you know about, which is that a lot of these attempts are going uh, awry. So. How to think about this? Well, one way to think about entrepreneurship and, and new businesses is to think about a couple of terms that sociologists will recognize. Think about new businesses in terms of cultural codes. That is a cultural code meaning basically if you, if you see a gas station, if you see something that looks like a gas station, you know it's a gas station. If you see a restaurant, yeah, that's a restaurant. If you see a bank, yeah, that's a bank. Right? Cultural codes are the learned uh, the, the learned recipes we have for recognizing that something belongs in a category we're familiar with. Right? So that's a cultural code. So everybody pretty much, I can say to you, is that a bank or is that a gas station? You probably know, yeah, that's a bank and that's a gas station. That, that's, this is the, by the way, this is a secret to Hannon and Sue's categorical stuff. This is the real secret to that. You, you, know, you teach that paper? Anybody teach that paper? Yeah. yeah, that's the secret, really. Humans can recognize the difference between gas stations and restaurants. Uh, it's a little more complicated, but that's the basic thrust of the argument. But the question is, uh, does that give you what you need to know to actually build one of those? So you can see the difference. You know that's a gas station and that's a restaurant. Does that mean, yeah, you you've recognize that you can code it. You know what category it belongs in. It makes you comfortable. Yeah, I'm happy you're dealing with them. But does it actually mean you know what to, how to build one of these? And the answer is probably no. Right, the blueprints you need to, act, to, to build an organization are much more complicated than understanding what category something goes in. And that's the key to what I'm, I'm going to be talking about for much of the rest of the time. That is the, the, the difficulty humans have in trying to figure out how to construct an organization, especially if they haven't had experience previously doing that. Right? Even actually being in one doesn't help a whole lot. It's like, because you've all been in educational institutions for a long time, could you build a university yourself? No, you've been, you're in schools, you've, been, you've worked in all kinds of places, could you build one of those? But probably not. So that's the, that's the kind of the uh, contrast I want to, I'm going to draw on. Now why is that, why do I make such a big deal of this difference between cultural codes and organizing, and blueprints? Well, let me show you what you find in the media. This is one of these is from Forbes.com. The other is SBA.gov. And you forbid, normally, I don't like to read stuff to people when they can read themselves. So you, you notice most of my slides don't have many words on them. Here's a case where I'm going to read along. Let's read along together if you want. This is from Forbes.com. This is a, this is an article inviting people to consider starting their own business. How hard can it be? You don't need a fancy pedigree or specialized set of skills to launch a business. Just muster up some courage. Do a bit of research. Your professors would like that. Do a bit of research. Secure a tax identification number, and you're ready to go. Read off for seven ideas, some of which require more care and capital than others. Is that inviting or what? You, you, is that, would you buy a, a, a business from this person? Okay. <laughs> Now, look at this, sba.gov. This is when the website was up, okay, before the shutdown. Follow these 10 steps. It doesn't say 10 easy steps, but it's implied. Starting a business. Starting a business involves planning, making key financial decisions, and completing a series of legal activities. These 10 easy steps can help you plan, prepare, and manage your business. Click on the links to learn more. Okay, so these, this is a, this is a, not a, I haven't cherry picked. This is, you find this all the time in the, in the, the literature, right? So you look at this, you say, wow, how hard can it be? You know, this is, this is yeah, sure, I can, I, can, I can do that, I can manage that. Can we? So to set up the, the best possible contrast for my argument, I, I did cherry pick an example, I admit that. How many of you play a music? Anybody play a musical instrument here? Anybody play? Anybody in a jazz group? You, you like to go to jazz groups? You go to jazz? Okay, so you probably observed, this is the most extraordinary thing to me. I'm, I'm a jazz buff, and I, I love going to jazz clubs and watching this happen. 
Uh, if, you like, if you're a sociologist and you like jazz, you should read Howie Becker's stuff, Howie, Howie Becker with uh, Rob Faulkner. Do you know this latest book? Uh, do you know? No? Okay. You should, wonderful, wonderful stuff. And they just actually issued a second piece of that, which is available on Amazon. It's, they've issued um, they, their exchange in writing the book. See, Howie Becker and Rob Faulkner are both jazz musicians, but they're also keen analytic minds, and they actually write about the performance process and the, the process of getting to the point where when you see a jazz performance, it happens smoothly. So when you go to a jazz club and you see, this is the trio, you see people on the stage performing. You, it's, some people don't believe this is true, but it, it could be the case those people never met before. Right, three skilled jazz musicians who know the canon, who know the American songbook, the great American songbook, three skilled musicians can get together and have never having played before, can deliver a, 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 a beautiful performance under very pressure-packed conditions in a jazz club. They can perform. How is that possible? Because they're each individually skilled. They know the routines. They know somebody, somebody calls out the name of the tune, somebody uh, tells them the chord, somebody counts out the beat, and somebody uh, has the melody. If somebody doesn't know the melody, they'll sit through the first time around, and the second time they'll come in and play. They know, they know about turn-taking. There's all kinds of things that are uh, available in the, in the common knowledge base they share. So when they make a team, that's the critical word here, when they make a startup team, which is what this is, they make a startup team, they have the ability to draw upon all this capital, the routines, the, the habits of a lifetime, the, the disciplined habits about playing their instrument, the, uh, the, uh, the, the heuristics that are, that are required to understand what the music is that's being played. So you take that as an archetype to a successful team, people coming together to create a team, and you ask yourself, okay, now let's just do a little thought experiment. What happens when people try to create businesses? How close do the teams putting businesses together come to this amazing human um, activity that we see in a jazz club? Now the implication, what's the answer to that question, by the way? You were here at rehearsals, weren't you? Yeah, okay, so Ed knows. Yeah, it's, by that standard, if you take that as a standard for effortless, smooth, pressure-packed performance under highly competitive conditions, the, the startup teams are going to fall short, actually, woefully short, in fact. So in, in the work I've been doing the last few years, I've been writing about this. I think one of the papers I sent along, that some of you saw, is called How Do Entrepreneurs Know What to Do? I think that's that the one that somebody, somebody see, you see that? Is that the one they got? Uh, the one that is How Do Entrepreneurs Know What to Do? That was available Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so in that paper, I go into greater detail. I'll just uh, skim the surface now just to give you a sense of the argument. So here are these people. They want to be entrepreneurs. The startup team wants to come together and create something. What do they have to know how to do? What do they have to have? Well, boil this down into the, the three components listed here. Uh, it would be helpful if they have the right habits, habits including things like discipline, showing up for work on time is a good start, uh, knowing the heuristics in the, uh, in the business and what, what shortcuts, what cognitive shortcuts they can take dealing with, their, with the particular environment they're going to find in this, in this whatever the, the industry might be. Uh, and then it's extremely helpful if there's standard practices or routines in this industry that they know those as well. And how are they going to get this information? What are the ways in which you could acquire the right habits, learn the right heuristics, and learn the routines that collectively will make it possible for your startup attempt to succeed? So if you think about this from the point of view, I like to approach it from a Marchian point of view, which is, uh, or actually standard, maybe cognitive psychology, how do entrepreneurs, what are the ways in which people who become entrepreneurs eventually might have learned this stuff? What are the routes that, that they could have followed to become more uh, knowledgeable on those three fronts? Now here's a point where I want to stop and make sure everybody's still with me. So if you have questions, Okay, no questions? All right. Is it? Yeah. Because one theme in, in the things you showed before was a sort of democratic sense of entrepreneurship. I mean, it should be a democratic, you know, everybody can do it. It's not you know, a fancy degree. 
it just seems to me that's an interesting kind of tension. Your point that you need that it's actually a skilled activity. That yeah. So so one of the ways. So one of, the ways to, one of the ways to read all these self-help manuals and the airport bookshop stuff and the, the magazines, one of the ways to read that is, is to, this is a great point, one of the ways to read, to read this is to say, there's an assumption there that this, you can learn this quickly. And maybe learn on the job. Right? If you don't know now, when you start the process, you'll learn quickly. Right? And, you know, and one of the questions I have for you later on is, uh, how fast can you learn? Right? But that's, so the assumption is, yeah, the prior knowledge is not so important. What's important is that you are given the instructions you need, the blueprints, in a sense, on paper, told this is what you do, and then they learn, you learn fast enough to learn on the job so that you can succeed before you get uh, crushed by the environment that you're in. So, yeah, and there is, I think that you're right, the, the implication, the, democ the, the open access appeal to this does make an assumption about speed of learning, how easy it is to learn. And, and what I'm talking about now is quite the opposite, that, that uh, the things that you actually probably need to know are not easily acquired. In fact, uh, let me just say a few things about some of those. So one of the, one of the um, sources, there's a big industry actually on family business. I don't think Carolina has any. The business school have anything on family business here? Anybody know? Probably not, but there's a huge, uh, because you hear these numbers about how many, what proportion of all businesses are family businesses. If you actually include husband and wife businesses as family businesses, then that's, that's about uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of all team startups. There are, are spousal teams. But that's not what people typically mean about when they say family business. But you look at it, what are the, what's the, one of the first ways a, a, a child could learn about this? Well, it could be the case that some of the people coming into entrepreneurship are doing it because, are prepared for it because they have come up through a family business. It's one way it could, be, it could happen. You can actually have acquired particularly discipline the habits of discipline and hard work, you might have acquired those. Maybe it's the case also that you learned some of the heuristics that you needed. It turns out if we actually, and this is something I have done some research on, if you actually look at the opportunities most people have had in their lifetime to be associated with a business in which they would have been, in a sense, uh, an apprentice to a mentor, it's, it's a very unlikely scenario. right? Because most people who are in, let's call, talk about self-employment now for a moment as a labor market, for most people, self-employment is a short spell. Business is a short spell. It lasts three or four years, and they try it once, and it's gone. So if you look at somebody's life, working life, there's a spell here, it starts here, and it ends three or four years later. Right. Now imagine, we're factoring into this, the possibility that children could be tutored by parents in business. Okay. What would have to happen? The kids would have to come along at exactly the right time to be there when the parents are in the business so that the kid is old enough to work in the business, old enough to be working in the business, but not too old to already be out in a, on another job, or too young not to be there. Right? So there's a very narrow window that, uh, that actually would work for people to acquire that in, from the family, direct, direct skills. Um, so th some of the, the people who've studied the uh, occupational inheritance, it's called in, social, in occupational mobility studies, occupational inheritance, I think typically the conclusion is what actually has happened is that um, Things like uh, uh, desire for autonomy or need for conformity, the kind of Mel Cohen stuff, that actually that's possibly what's gone on. But it's, it's, it, you could actually have developed certain ways of looking at the world being in a, print, in a household. But you, it's not very likely that people, the family businesses are a very important preparation for uh, starting your own business. Uh, education and training, this is really kind of, uh, I looked into this uh, last year when I was thinking about this as a project. And here, you know, it, obviously we're an educational institution, so we all believe, we wouldn't be here otherwise, we all believe that education and training pay off, right? And why do we believe that? Well, because people come in as first-year students, they go out as fourth-year students, and you look at the, that change and it looks after four years, like, or five years, probably here, five and a half years. How many people graduated in four years? From college? No, no, from first year to fourth year. Freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. Four years? Yeah, few, okay, so three. Oh, right. uh, so we, we, look at, we look at that and we say, oh yeah, look at the change between first year and fourth year, first year and last year, right? Because the, what's, the, what's the counterfactual? Right, well, what would have happened anyway? 
we don't, that's, that's the big, that's the accountability push that we're getting from some parts of the educational institutional establishment now. Yeah, we, typically we don't have a counterfactual. It's the case that most people get smarter as they get older because they, they just learn more. Whether college actually makes a net difference is kind of hard to tell because we have to run an experiment, and we don't do that. We can't do that. Randomly pick high school seniors, send some of them to college and some of them not. It's not going to work in American society. Well, the same thing is true of people trying to study, does, does, do programs to help entrepreneurs or train people to be entrepreneurs make a difference? And so actually it turns out there's a handful of studies that have done this. Gold standard. They pick people randomly who, who said they were interested in it. They put some of them into courses and some of them they just let languish in non-courses. And in some of these they've also actually given some of these people money and some of them not. And, the, and this is covered in one of the papers I sent, but just the bottom line is uh, don't invest in training programs for entrepreneurs at this moment. It looks like it's very hard for any of these programs to really show consequential differences in the people who've been through them. Most of the studies that look at entrepreneurship education don't have control groups. And they don't have the gold standard control group. They just see they have a before and after. And of course, you know, anything that happens to people between measurement at time one and measurement at time two is possibly behind what we see in, the, in the, uh, the changes. But in these gold standard studies, there's not much evidence. The only evidence actually we have is international studies that have shown that uh, interventions by uh, international teams in uh, I think Peru, Afghanistan, uh, uh, so Nigeria. There, there's some studies that actually show taking people with a very low level of economic literacy, putting them in a classroom, and then giving them some money does make a difference. But in Western capitalist societies, like you know, these studies mostly in the United States, no, doesn't even make any difference. So, so far we're not batting very well here, right? To remember, because the, the question I've asked you is, what, what is going, what are the likely, what's the likelihood that somebody comes into the process of starting their own business prepared, well prepared? What are the routes that they could follow? Yeah, and lots of them. It has to be lots of them. Uh, it's certainly the case that being parts of ethnic networks could give you access to perhaps better terms of trade, perhaps perhaps some capital. Um, again, by the standard I'm using to judge my own work, uh, I would I would say the jury still out as to whether, given some of those people are doing that because they couldn't get into like Koreans, for example, they couldn't get into the regular. Market. I mean, they're they're pretty. Pretty skilled people to begin with. But there's variation. There's variation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible. Yeah. How, so. I've been visiting quite a few of the startup firms in New York City, and I'm really struck by how they never talk about the difficulties of running the organization. It's, they almost seem to have a. Many of them were in athletics, and so the sport team. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were on the same team together. Others uh, come out of college with uh, just as they want to start a firm, but the interviews never talk about mishaps in yeah. designing the firm because they have some notion of what a startup should look like, even physically, for the space. Yeah. The, uh, so that's why we get to. That's why I was going to get to. That's the third okay. piece of it. But yeah. So a couple of things to think about, though. Most of this, mo this is the, the field of entrepreneurship studies for decades was plagued by incredible selection bias. So most of, the, most of the research we actually have on entrepreneurship, until the last no, no, 10 or 15 years, uh, most of the research on entrepreneurship was based on studying successful businesses. The, the sampling frames that were always picking businesses that had made it to a certain stage. So when, in case of looking at the kind of high tech, high capitalization, highly selected populations like the kind you'd see in Silicon Valley, uh, the, yeah, you're talking about people who, who have been, been filtered repeatedly. So this, my, I'm really talking about the millions, right? This is, yeah. There's a, there, there, there could be some, what percentage it would be, certainly less than 1%, but there, are, there is a portion of the population that would have the kind of access to the, the experiences you're describing that would not have the problems I'm talking about here, yeah. Um, although on the other hand, the, the studies at Silicon Valley, um, the, the, the project that Martin Roof did before he and I did the paper with the PSED back in the early 2000s, Martin, used Stanford MBA graduates to look at the kinds of teams they formed. You re if you remember the 2000 
three paper we did, we, we showed that homophily was pretty much the dominant principle. <laughs> Martin's study of the, the, the Stanford MBAs showed the same thing. Incredibly non-diverse teams. Age, edu well, education, but age, sex, uh, occupational background, incredibly homo. They violated all the things they'd learned in business school. Everything they'd learned about comp skill complementarity, diverse, you know, diversity in the team, they, they violated all those things. So, um, and we also know it's the case that uh, the teams, even when Silicon Valley, even when venture capitalists try to put together teams, they, their, their track record is not great. Right? The port they use a portfolio model because they actually can't figure out what the secret sauce is. So they, if they put together 10 teams, they know that when they, when they come in and invest and then start replacing people, uh, they know that maybe one in 10 of those is going to make it. So even those people, highly selected already, are still subject to being buffeted by the kinds of pressures that I'm talking about here that are facing the typical, not these people, but the typical entrepreneur. David? Are those groups more, is their failure rate low, or are they more insulated from failure in the sense that they, their business may fail, but then they have a chance to start something else yeah. or get involved in something else? Yeah, so They're be, not at risk. Of oh, no, they, they land on their feet, yeah. I mean, right. they, they, but um, that's a good point. Again, this, this, the unit of analysis, what I'm talking about, is the organization. So the critical thing for me, oh, just to say it, the critical thing in entrepreneurship is building an organization. Right? That's the critical thing. It's building an organization. That's why I focus on blueprints, cultural codes. The, the most difficult thing to do is to put an organization together that's a bounded entity that's sustaining, can be sustained, and particularly outlive its founder. It's a very hard thing to build an organization, bound it, give it find it a place in the, in the cultural firmament, have it be in a, pl in a position where it's, it's not, not legitimate, because most businesses are, you know, capital society are legitimate, but find it a place where its reputation is positive, and then have it be self-sustaining. That's a very difficult thing to do. And so it, many people can't do it. They have great individual human and social capital, but they don't, for reasons that I'm getting at here, they, they, they can't build an organization. They can't put a team together that, that creates an organization. Uh, we can come back to that if you, if you like, but that's... I mean, because I guess that, maybe that's your next point, but I, I guess I was wondering, for instance, what's the relationship between having worked in the area and success? Because one line would be people don't know much about the business that they're trying to start. Versus they don't know much about how an organization works. I mean, like those are two different yeah. So it's a typical problem. Yeah. So there is. So and both of those. It uh, turns out actually that prior experience in business is not as important as working in the same industry. Yeah. Working yeah, the, working in the same industry. So so we actually uh, in our one of the projects we did with PSED two. I don't I don't talk too much about. Uh, I'm not sure we've ever actually published on this yet. But the the. Um, Having work experience, managerial work experience in the same industry is pretty, pretty consequential. It does, it lowers, we were looking at uh, rates of abandoning the startup attempt. And people who have experience working in, as a manager in the same industry are less likely to abandon the startup attempt early. And people who started their business before in the same industry are also less likely. So there is, there is a return, there is a return to experience. Again, it's, it's available to a small number of people, but there is a return to experience, and it does look like it's both. It's not so much actually knowing about organizations, it's knowing about organizations in this particular industry. Now, the other part to this, this is a, a, a well, when you, let me I'll say something, because I think you'll appreciate this. Yeah. There's a lot of knowledge about, about the sort of products in that industry that may be able to acquire and then get a market. I'm just kind of wondering, I'm thinking about the market forces. Yeah, I would say. I mean, yeah. So I would say that to me, the big because when I my studies are mostly of startups, so you know, um, it's it's about it's about getting the organization that, that hangs together. It's 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 knowing what you have to do. It's and again, I have I've been very fortunate. Some of you know this. My my oldest son is a serial entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. So I've I've watched this over the last 15. years. He started one of the one of the first dot com companies, and so I've been watching my own little experiment, watching my son. And I, I have a lot of tales to tell, but one of the things that I, I observed is just how difficult this building process actually is, and how critical, and all the networking part's important to this too, but it's very hard to build a high growth business. It's very hard to do that. So one, so now, but come back to the more general question, because we're talking about normal human beings here, not Silicon Valley, Harvard, Stanford MBAs, Cornell MBAs, we're talking about normal human beings. One of the things that has been made very salient to me recently, uh, partly because of my work in Europe, 
is that most organizations, most businesses in particular, are not organized such that people in them are learning about organizing. The, the people in, in small businesses sometimes they get cross-trained, cross-functional training, but, but most people in an organization, siloed organizations, highly specialized occupational titles, very narrow span of responsibility. Uh, if those of you who um, maybe, maybe recall you're trying to get your first job, you may remember that the um, interviewers typically ask about experiences. How many experiences, and they're particularly interested in when they're talking to people who recently graduated college, did you ever organize anything? Did you work on a, on a job in which you have responsibility for supervising other people? So if you tell them you're a server in a restaurant, they don't care. They said, did you manage the shift? Ah, right. did you open and close the place? Right. Questions like that. So the, the kinds of jobs available in the American economy, most economies, to, to normal workers don't really give them the breadth of training and experience they would need to actually know when they're put in the position that they themselves have to reproduce what that organization was like. They don't know the template. They don't know that blueprint. So the, the organization of work itself makes it difficult for people with just working experience to actually build an organization. Now there's a case where if you push us a little bit, you know, the ILR school might take this under, under its wing, right? How could you reorganize work? How could you organize work in such a way that you would actually encourage your employees to develop the kinds of skills that might benefit them if they were ever to become interested in starting their own business? Right, and some, and some. This is this is where Silicon Valley is relevant because there are some Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. My, my son is one of them, actually, who actually talk about their employees and give their employees opportunities to learn stuff that, that makes them clearly more valuable to other businesses. Right? And they they do this on, on deliberately because they think while they have those people, they'll get a lot of work out of them. But they know that same, at the same time, this breadth of responsibility and experience means they're more likely to leave. So. The upshot of this is uh, families, became, families perhaps give people, uh, teach people to value autonomy. And autonomy, we know, feeds into this uh, desire people have for uh, having their own business, but not so much in terms of skills, education, and training. Partly, this is a difficulty. This is difficult if because if you know the recent work, the work on um, the way that knowledge is distributed across a startup across teams. You know, if you imagine, imagine having a startup team and we pluck one person out of it and send them to training, right? Two weeks, three weeks, a month, whatever it is, and bring them back into that team. And I'll say, okay, get to now do something. As opposed to taking the whole startup team, three, four of them, if it's a high-tech team, probably five of them, sticking them in some training program and having them all come back, right? That's the difference between, so the, in the second case, we've taken the distributed knowledge, we've taken the team that holds the distributed knowledge somewhere, gotten them trained, they've come back, now they know who, who knows what. In the case of plucking one person out, which is what most of these pro programs do, or having somebody uh, go solo through this program and then later on try to recruit other people to join him or her, th it's a very difficult thing to transfer. It's a very difficult. So much of this knowledge is actually uh, tacit knowledge or implicit knowledge. So. So I would say these, the, 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 the difficulties here, for me at least, help me appreciate, understand that what we're looking at with this liability of newness and the numbers I'm going to show you in a second, the, the volatility, it's, you know, this is actually, well, let me just show you. Uh, yeah, so come back. Wh why are we talking about this? Because it's really difficult. This is a hazard function. Now, again, those of you who do hazard models know that numbers don't actually mean much. It's the shape of the curve. So this is either, uh, this is either probably, uh, you could see this as devastatingly terrible for startups, or you could see this, actually, this is pretty good, because it actually does look like it's the case that over, over months, the, the hazard of, of, of exiting the startup does drop, right? So it is clear the people who are left, well, you don't know this, either the people who are left have learned something, or this is a pure selection model, and all we've done is knocked off the incompetence first, and eventually we're not, we have people who are less competent. So it's a pretty steep and this, what this does is, is knock off about half, of the, about half of the startups gone within two years. And about 20% basically get organized in five years to the point where you can say it's a real viable business. How do you have uh, data about the population of entrepreneurs who fail and then try again and fail and try again? Are they successful? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a, the serial entrepreneurs are a big, big topic. We used to be a huge, bigger topic of discussion. The problem is getting data. Most of the data that's on serial entrepreneurs is heavily selection biased because they take people who have been successful multiple times and write about them. So actually getting what we can see is that it is the case that when people start, if they've done it before, they have an advantage. We know that. What I can't tell you with any degree of confidence is, well, I, we know that if you look at the distribution of startup attempts, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, I mean, it's like this, right? Most people do it once, a few people do it two or three times. So it is the case that if they try it again, it does look like there's an advantage overall to, to trying it the second time, but not many people do that. Because in this random sample of uh, entrepreneurs in China, we notice that many of the Yeah, in the American context, that would be incredibly rare. I see. But I, I don't know that um, that would be incredibly rare to find somebody who'd, who'd done that. Silicon Valley, probably not so much, but uh, most people try it once and they don't try it again. In fact, there's a, there's a literature, growing literature, on what, because, of the, because of the psychological consequences. People um, trying and failing to start a business has real, some studies now are showing people, it has real, real psychological consequences for many people. It's an identity blot. You know, there's a, people using the identity concepts, role identity, that it's a, it's a blot on your identity to have not made it. So despite the fact that um, people celebrate the U.S. as a culture where failure is acceptable, it does have its consequences. So the, the long, short answer to your question is I, I can't really give you, I don't, trust the, I don't trust the literature on serial entrepreneurs in terms of, of um, what the true likelihood of succeeding is once you've failed. I, I can't, I don't, I don't have data I trust. But I do have data. Oops. Here we go. You, you saw this earlier. This is, this is the, the most startling uh, piece of information. This is, takes the same data set you saw before when those, those tables early on. This looks at it a little different way. This is, again, all the, all the business, all the establishments that started in 1994. That's over there in the upper left. And, and the, that one cohort has followed through to uh, 2011, 2010. Oh, sorry, 2010, yeah, for 17 years. And then each cohort has, is a different color because we had them for fewer years, you know, 17, 16, 15, 14. And so a couple of things you can see from this, and again, it's uh, either a glass half full or glass half, no, mostly a glass, mostly empty, I guess. You can see that, um, again, after, after five years in every cohort, no matter we're talking 94, 2004, 2010, in every cohort about half the businesses that were registered were gone in, after five years. Now these are businesses, again, with employees, and they made it into the BLS statistics, which means they, have, they had an employee who worked long enough in a quarter that they had to pay unemployment insurance on them. These are not startups. These are, this is not about startups. These are about, I don't know, quote, real businesses or businesses that at least made it into the, the database where um, they, had a, a they had an employer ID number that's a, and so, uh, and Victor was saying earlier, he looked at this and he said, wow, 20, 25% made it 17 years. That's, I guess, is that good? I, you know, if you, if you looked at a population of humans and only 25% lived to age 17, you'd, you'd probably change doctors, right? <laughs> but businesses, maybe we, have, we, don't, we shouldn't expect so much. If you're an investor, as, as long as they were paying dividends along the way, you might be okay with this too. I don't know. If you're expecting, and if, and if the exits were based on capital, uh, maybe, maybe they were selling out. Some of them do actually manage to be sold. But the other thing to notice about this is the, the curve, the shape, the, the slope of the curve doesn't change very much. So the population as a whole hasn't, hasn't, doesn't seem to have learned anything. So the, the population curve is about the same back in the early days as it, as it seems to be more recently. All those curves pretty much laid on top of each other. It's not dramatically. I mean, most small businesses are undercapitalized, and that's why they go under. Do you, are you able to control for um, startup capital? Okay. Is there a minimum yeah, that would uh, oh. have better experience? Than yeah, and this PSCD project we're doing, which we haven't published this one yet, but the PSCD project, actually, it's a very small amount of money. $3,000 of invested capital uh, is a tremendous boost to survivability. And actually, in a, the, the, we've actually, we've actually experimented with different functional forms where we've had, 
taking amount of capital invested as a linear term, as a what, as a curvilinear term. Turns out we basically wound up just using it as a as a as a categorical variable under under three thousand, under twenty five thousand. There's a threshold above which it doesn't make any difference. Now these are startups. These are this is these are mundane, typical, ordinary, random, everyday construction, uh, uh, retail sales, business services. Con, uh, you know the average. But in this population. Uh, a very small amount of money makes a huge difference, and we think it's not. We think it's money for these people getting started is not so much. Um, it's not what directly what the money is doing. It's also a sign of, of commitment and, and belief in the in the in the uh, the viability of what they're doing. So people who put a little bit of money in and signal to other people they're also committed. So it's. A, I would say of all the things you could look at in terms of helping people, money is probably not so important in the startup stage. For the average business person, the skills of building an organization. As a sociologist, I would say this, of course. Economists tell you something different. They'll talk about capital constraints. But actually, I, I would say that it's it's building an organization. But we do we'll we'll be publishing that hopefully in the next couple of years. Okay, so jump to the audience participation part of the of the talk. So one question is one way to look at the this par this paradox of the great appeal of the, of the status of the actorhood, of being an entrepreneur, versus the reality of what you face in the world itself, is to say, uh, why, can't they, why can't these people learn? Why can't they learn faster? What's going on? What's, what's the problem with, with um, them as, as learners? Right? As, if they didn't know enough when they started, okay, give them that, maybe they just some of these people are dropping out because they can't learn quickly enough. It's one possibility. So, uh, so some of the stuff I've been I've been looking for help with this, but it's just a very hard question to research. It's going to be difficult because to really do this well, you need you, I would think you need to be an ethnographer, or you need to be able to have access to people where you can query them and follow them like weekly basis. What are they learning? What did they learn this week? What did they forget? What are they learning over again? Right. And the, the point, come back to why I said organization is important, one way to think about the creation of businesses is that they're trying to build a stable platform that lasts from one day to the next. Imagine if every day you came to your office, all your routines were gone and you had to start over again. Imagine you're coming to your business and you had no way to, to, to archive, no way to, to hang on to the stuff you, that worked yesterday, that you had today. Your employees were helter-skelter. You had no files. You didn't have the right software, right? So one of the things that you have to understand about the business building process, the startup. This is you'll probably see this in your New York City stuff. One of the things those people know how to do, they know how to retain what they've learned. They've got a retention system that works. They've got they've got uh, computer software. They've developed routines. They understand about roles, role definitions, role relationships, job descriptions. The, the sequential order in which things are going to be done. So, um, but that's a problem. If you're a small business, one, two, three people, four people, household based, many of these, half of them are household based when they start, uh, other things intervening, it's going to be very difficult. So, learning on the fly under the conditions that we're talking about here and undercapitalized, highly competitive, it's going to be very difficult. Okay, the other, the other thing that's really interesting theoretically is, is to ask, um, back to the, the question of how we should think about this churn, and we, this is what we talked about earlier today in Victor's seminar, one of the ways to see what's going on here is all these businesses, these millions and millions of businesses that are starting, these are all trials. These are all experiments. These are all ways people have, are trying, to, to, trying out something. There may be slight variations on what already exists. There may be radical variations on what, uh, what exists. And to the extent that, that the ones that are getting picked off first are the more radical innovations, the ones that are potentially game-changing, disruptive innovations, then this pattern I've showed you of early deaths means that the, we're constantly losing uh, this, this potential uh, positive heterogeneity and innovative capability. From the population, so anything back to the, the very the intervention side of me, so anything potentially that would change the shape, just push that slope out a little bit, just give people another few months, give them a, you know five more months, just give me five more months, Lord, six months, whatever, 
anything to give them enough time to incubate whatever it is they're working on and get it to the point where it actually might be diffused, right? Might be of benefit. Okay, now let's, let's say you have a really smart person and they've tried something. This is concept, actually, the, the term stopped being used a little while, but called pivot. Or you, you try, you, you really got, you're very smart people, you try something, it doesn't work, try something else. A little tweak, right? Because clearly most people are reproducers. Most people enter industries in which they're just one more of the same, but there's some slight variation on what they're trying to do. Um, Maybe it's a matter of lasting long enough to figure out, hey, this is not working. So part of the organization building process, back to these high skilled people, the, the, really, the, the entrepreneurs who've been through MBA programs and have done it once or twice have feedback systems. So they actually, they're, they're monitoring. This is um, like my, my son's companies. And one of the things that he's had the, the last two companies, these people are, they're constantly finding out what users are doing with their stuff. They're constantly checking with the users. What are you doing? He, he gave, my, in the last company, my son gave the 300,000 customers, he gave them his phone number. They could call him. Right? So, the, so you're, you're the, not, not too many people dead, okay. But the idea is you're constantly learning. So if you, if you have enough, if you actually have a system in place, if you've learned that what you need to do is figure out quickly that something's not working, you can change. If you have no system in place for learning this until you check your cash flow and it's not only zero, it's, it's, it's way in the negative, it's too late. So yes, maybe some of the ideas are bad. Uh, maybe people, had they been a little more successful at figuring out how to build an organization, might have said, well, OK, this is not working. Let's try something different. Uh, right, but yeah. I mean, might a little bit of this, yeah. but because um, obviously all these things are yeah, really interesting and complex and difficult activities. And so there is the building of the organization. Or kind of, I mean, it just strikes me, uh, it's very um, natural for a business school to kind of seek to abstract away from running a business or starting a business, the kind of notion of, of, of entrepreneurial skill more generically conceived. Mm -hmm. So somebody is, you know, it doesn't, they don't need to know anything about the industry or that's not so important. They know how to run a business so they know how to manage people or how to deal with people. And of course, that's a big, you know, very important, crucial Element. But anyway, so, so it seems like there, you know, a couple of different lines you could take. One problem could be, well, in fact, it abstracted way too much, sort of put a lot in the concept of the of the of the entrepreneur as a generic talent, mm -hmm. versus the person who knows some business well. Um, and you know, so so I mean, so that going back, because the jazz group seems to me to point in a different direction than the one that I understand. You're going. I mean, the jazz group. It is. It's a temporary group, so it's going to play for an evening, and that's a, maybe yeah. a hit. But what they don't say is what we need is an organizational guru or a band leader or something like that. They need a drummer, they need, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So that kind of suggests that what you really need is the skills of the specific role players. Activity, yeah, yeah, right. Versus the generic organizational management kind of skills. And so I guess I'm, you know, my inclination is to think of, of the business-specific skills as the, mm -hmm. as the key thing and something that could get lost in just abstracting the, the problem. Yeah, but anyway. That's true. And the, 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 what's surprising in that respect, then, you, you would imagine that people who start in the same industry would have a tremendous advantage. And actually, they don't. They have an advantage, but it's not a tremendous advantage. It's a slight advantage. Now, again, the difficulty, what well, you're, you're pointing to is a problem um, the, the research community studying entrepreneurship is yet to confront, which is, in fact, the thing is getting worse. More and more people are, are working with big data. So you see people using data on scientists and engineers who've left one company and started another. And I point out to them, well, you know, what, what they actually, the data they actually have, for example, is they know somebody was, was in this company, was a successful company, and they left and started, and they, they're now attached to another company listed as a founder. But in the, in the high tech sector, where many of these studies are done, you don't found a company with one person. There are typically two or three people. The other people on the team may be the critical movers and shakers. That person 
which come from this company. You, you don't actually know. There's no, there's no questioning of what that person actually brought to the business, right? So, so what you're talking about, again, I come back to what I said earlier, the, the critical way to really figure out how much of this is, is uh, industry and then skill specific knowledge that's needed, how much of it is just generic organization building, which is part of what I'm going with this, is part, part of it is just learning how to monitor feedback and having a way to retain feedback and act on the feedback and experiment, uh, which can be a generic skill, would be really micro level information. And the stuff, like the stuff you did within Yellow Pages, right? I mean, when you have, you, we know we have lots of data now at the level of arm's length so we can we can talk about different differences across industries. We know industries different. Restaurants are a terrible business to enter because the, the the failure rate in, in restaurants is really high. Uh, you know, and there are other industries where it's where it's much lower. We know that's okay. That's true. It's something about the industry. It's highly competitive. Barriers to entry are low. But the micro level stuff we need for this kind of question, you and Pam are pushing me on, and Victor and Ed, you know, would be um, if anything. There's I've been talking with the Kauffman Foundation. We've been trying for a year to try to recruit people to do ethnographic studies of startups. It's incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. We have money. Anybody out there? Anybody? Anybody? If you wanted to do an ethnographic study of, of a handful of startups, we, I have money for you. I can get you money. We can't give this money away. We had, I had a, I had, I've had two people lined up, and both of them were told, uh, one's still in grad school by her, her uh, chair, you, you know, don't do this. It's a career killer. It takes too long. And the other person, I don't know what happened. So we we can't get people to do these kinds of studies. What we have instead is people either doing using these, these big data sets, like PSED, PSED2, the all these archival data, the patent. Well, the patent data doesn't take me there. But there's a lot, there's a lot of data that's arm's length, and then the survey data by almost always is cross sectional. Uh, very seldom is it uh, dynamic multiple time, multiple uh, interviews over time, and that uh, no thought given to how far apart the interview should be if they do them, right? So we're really in a bad place to answer these questions. So part of what I'm doing going around the country is giving this talk, is just saying to people, look, uh, there's a lot of really interesting questions here that at the level of uh, generating information that would be actually helpful in designing an intervention, uh, we don't have. Yeah. Is this all right to ask? Sure, go ahead. I'm, I'm the, um, it seems to me that if you take the total population of firms that are, firms that are established, um, regardless of initial capital, regardless of initial size, uh, that you really have such a mix of population if the people who are starting these firms. Because some, a lot of people may be wanting to start up a business aren't really confident in the sense of running a business. They just, they submit, they just start a business uh, with two people or with their savings. And then you have another group of people who are planning it carefully in the business model. Uh, they're uh, at a different, a different level of um, organization and preparedness. Yes, so I get this question, the, the question, yes, heterogeneity question. One of the really hard for people to, to, to appreciate. Uh, assets don't predict survival. Assets don't predict growth. One of the most amazing things, this is uh, you, having, having millions versus thousands makes, a net of things makes no difference. This is, again, this, the venture capitalist is a great place to see this, but you can see it other places as well. It's incredibly difficult. In fact, John Haltewanger, in this, in, uh, in a couple of days ago, was on one of the NPR uh, marketplace shows. Maybe it was yesterday talking about this, that a priori, you, you give me a hundred firms, and I, I cannot, at the day one, there's no way to tell you which one's going to grow. It's, I know it's impossible for you to believe this. Knowing the assets they're bringing to the table, knowing there's the, the education, there is no way to know which of these hundred or thousand firms, there's no way to know which are going to grow. It's unbelievable, but it's incredibly difficult. Now, give them more time as we watch them. This is what venture capitalists do, right? Venture capitalists wait. Why, wait, why do they wait four years or five years? They wait because they wait until all the, the, the weaklings have been picked off or for whatever reason, either because the idea was bad or the team didn't gel or it just it was the wrong place at the wrong time. They wait four or five years. That's why banks don't lend to startups. 
You know, it's not surprising if banks are complaining, that people complain they can't get money. That's where the Jobs Act is coming in. I wouldn't lend money to a startup. So going back to your first uh, point, that there's a cultural uh, myth about uh, the attractiveness of being an entrepreneur, they, uh, and yet uh, and that drags in people uh, willing to take that risk, but they don't know the way to fail you. Right. Or they do. You'll see, I mean, you talk to people. It's incredible, actually. You, you point this out. My, my son made a joke of this on, on, his, on the website for his last company. He has this paragraph you know, where they told the team. They showed Stephen Aldridge, CEO, and he gives us a little story. He said, yeah, when I was starting the business, my dad told my, my fiancé at the time, you know, most small business, most new businesses fail. Right? Doesn't mean anything, that, not me. Yeah. Right? They said, I'm not, sure, I know. Yeah, sure, that's true. Most businesses fail, but that's not me. I'm not going to fail. They, they, it's, they don't, uh, some of these people just don't think, well, it's true, sadistically speaking, because I can't tell them, I can't tell you which one of them won't make it. They can say, well, you can't tell me I can't make it, right? If I can't predict which of the businesses will make it, why, why, say, why say that you're the person who's not going to make it? Why not say I'm the person who will make it? I know somebody's going to make it. Why not me? So there's, there is a tremendous amount of heterogeneity. And the thing we've struggled with is trying to figure out when do we start to see this. So as I said, venture capitalists typically, that's why they don't do seed investments normally. They wait three, four, five years. And then when they see that something has gotten moving, and even then when they intervene quite often, they substantially change the, the game on those people. Um, that's, that's the nature of this, of this system. It's a, again, I, I hope this is coming through to you. This is, it's really important to understand this because you're going to hear this over. You'll hear if you go to when I talk to economists, the economists always say, "Oh, yeah, we don't care about those new those those businesses. We want to talk about the high growth businesses." I say, "Oh, yeah, it's interesting. Now, where's your yacht parked, right? And tell me again, why are you still having a, a wage and salary job? <laughs> it's it's crazy. There's 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 nobody nobody can pick out the high growth businesses from us. And when you have a sample of startups, you can't do it." You can do it event, give me enough time, but then any idiot can pick out, yeah, at some point you knew Google was going to make it. Okay, well, maybe not. Who knows? Still. And one more NSA re revelation. Good question. Um, I was wondering if, if technology and or social media has fallen into place in the last few years and if Yeah, it's a, well, it's a great question. I would say, yeah, I would say that um, one way to think about the technological revolution in the past 15 years is that it's probably raising, it's raising the competitive barrier, right? So, it, and so a lot of things we know, if you don't do them, you're going to be in real serious trouble. But if you do them, all it means is you're like everybody else, right? So when, if you look at all the business advice columns in the newspapers now, they all talk about learning social media. They go to a class on social media. There, there are consultants who make money. There's an industry of social media consultants that just work with businesses on how to use LinkedIn. Well, not LinkedIn so much, but how to use Twitter, how to use your website, how to use blogs. And, and the argument there is not that it'll get you ahead. It's that you have to do this to stay in, in the game, right? So, so yeah, I think, I think uh, all, all, this, all these new technologies have made, have made it more difficult for people who don't do these things to, to stay in. It's not so clear... Yeah. That, so now doing having a Twitter account doesn't uh, academic now with a Twitter account. Well, actually, an academic with a Twitter account is a dangerous person, isn't it? Because yeah, they're usually tweeting about their breakfast or something, or Britney Spears. But no, seriously, um, that's social media has. There's an industry. There's money to be made for social media, but it's not clear that you can say. I, I think you were asking, does it make a difference in when they survive, or you were saying, well, does it make a difference in what industries they. Oh. Oh. So why do you want to answer that question? <laughs> so the biggest, the biggest resource, the, the biggest constraint that startup people have is their time, mm -hmm. right? The, the biggest, one of the biggest, the few studies we have, the few ethnographies we have, or semi-ethnographies we have, 
is how difficult it is to prioritize, to decide what to do next. That is really difficult. So if I were advising somebody, uh, that it, the, the first, I would not make that my top priority early on. I would not do that. Right? I would make sure. That's why these, these consultants who do social media typically are industry, back to what David was implying before, they're, they're people who know something about a particular industry. So if you're selling um, business services as opposed to costume jewelry, if you're selling on Etsy as opposed to, I don't know, if, if Angie's List is really important to you. So if you're, if you're a business services person, you really better know how to, how to manage uh, Angie's List. You know know how, what it means to be, to get, how do you get a positive evaluation on Angie's List? What to do if you don't get a positive evaluation on Angie's List? Or if you're a restaurant, how to deal with Yelp? Right, there are consultants who can help you. So there, for particular industries, there would be particular kinds of social media you'd have to know how to deal with. i put it that way, yeah. But back to what they were saying, before, the, the heterogeneity there was pretty, pretty sizable. Question, yeah. I don't even know where the like the camera guy, but... Um, <laughs> the camera guy speaks. <laughs> yeah, um, so I read, I, you started off the talk talking about um, startup culture in Scandinavian countries, and I recently read an article about um, startup culture in Norway specifically, and um, they're saying that, um, you know, you can't really get much different than Norway versus the U.S. in terms of how, like, government support and the role of government, you know. Um, Norway's, you know, they call it socialist in the article I read, which ideas about that, but what do you think the role is of, com of countries that have greater um, economic support for their citizens in, you know, creating, um, like, how does that help the startup? Like, if you don't have to worry, like, you have lower risk to start a startup when you don't have to worry about your health insurance, where you get support from the government for, like, like, I read a lot of the companies early on in their creation, like, the government would fund them for their first couple of years. Yeah, you would think. Well, it, certainly the safety net in those countries is, is right is right below the the, the, the tightrope, whereas in the U.S. This, the safety net's been yanked out. I guess at this point, right? But, so in those countries, the safety net is right there, and you'd think that it would make people it would embolden people. But in fact, it it hasn't. Sweden and Norway have have very low compared to the to many other European countries. Very low startup rates. No, not Sweden and Norway. No, no, not Sweden and Norway. They have, yeah. No, the, all those, all the Scandinavian countries have have relatively low startup rates compared to France, compared to Spain or Italy or Portugal. They're pretty. They have low lower startup rates. In fact, I can't remember if Norway or Sweden is very low. And the argument there, there's a, there's an argument, and people who use the gem data. There's a question actually that asks about uh, are people starting a business out of necessity reasons or out of opportunity reasons? Which I, I hate the question, but the the thinking behind it is that in economies with these very strong safety nets, people uh, don't have to start a business. So they will wait until a great opportunity comes along. And then when the opportunity comes along, they will pounce on it. Uh, whereas in a country that's, uh, uh, Brazil has a very high startup rate. A country like Brazil, it's out of necessity. So in, some, in fact, in some African countries, according to the GEM data, huge proportions of the people are starting businesses, but they're, they're necessity businesses. They're doing it because they're selling water, they're selling access to a cell phone in their village or something like that. They're doing it because they have to. So the argument is that countries with strong safety nets actually depress the rate. It's not, uh, you know, people in uh, those countries have uh, tremendous benefit, maternal, paternal benefits. They get, they come back to their job after a year and a half off, uh, you know, incredible benefits. And, and the argument is rather than saying to them, oh yeah, go ahead and try this, it actually it just reduces the incentive to, to get out of the wage and salary sector. So then maybe the explanation might be that because the United States celebrates entrepreneurs, and especially successful ones, like Steve Jobs and Gates and the earlier the tycoons, people are blind to the risk they want to take a bet mm. on being as successful as a celebrated entrepreneurial hero and if they knew what the risks were they might not take it. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I, we, unfortunately, um, I can't remember in the GEM project if we actually have questions where we say to people, do you know what the chance is? That's a good question. I actually can't recall off the top of my head. There must be somewhere a survey that says, what do you think the odds are? 
right? But again, one of the things you get when you, when you talk to entrepreneurs individually, they typically don't define what they're doing as taking a risk. They, they say, this is, why is it a risk? I, I know what I'm doing. I, I used to be a plumber. I can start a plumbing business. Or I was a chef. I can start a restaurant. Or I, or I, I had kids. I can do a daycare center. Right? They, they, don't, they don't define it. They don't think of risk the way that economists think about risk versus uncertainty. Right? So, um, but for, you know, clearly, the, an individual startup is facing uncertainty. It's not risk. It's tremendous uncertainty because you, there's no way to know. You can't. You can say if this is exactly like others in this industry, then maybe you can use an insurance model. But uh, if to the extent that it's in a unique niche and it's, uh, I mean, it's it's very hard to get them to think this way. They, they, you don't you don't hear entrepreneurs really, if, if they talk about risk, they will say things like it's not a risk, it's not a risk. I know what I'm doing. It's, or or they'll say, or they, they might say yeah yeah, but um, I like it. They, they, it doesn't. They curiously enough. It's not really. That's why I don't talk. My research, I don't talk about this. I never, I never talk about risk. But it sounds as though they don't talk about uncertainty either. They say no. That we know, I know what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. These are foreign concepts. The Knightian concepts are just foreign to these folks. So you would think of something as, as, as culturally valued, and it also kind of feeds into people's individual set of values for economy and so on. That not only, you know, that it, as you say, I mean, it, so that would be. It would be overinvested in, and so there'd be both, you know, there'd be human costs of that of those who have invested in something yeah, that works. Yeah. But there'd also be social costs of too much entrepreneurial effort leading to attempts to form businesses that don't really gel and end up not producing something, and it would have been better off for people that mm -hmm. stayed, you know, with a company that already knew what it was doing. So, yeah. so uh, and. Um, so I guess I wondered, you know, about that, you know, the downside, not not to the entrepreneur, but to society. Yeah. This, yeah, this question comes up. I, I did this. I just talked about this a couple of weeks ago in Ann Arbor to the ICOS group. And we got in a great discussion because uh, there, is, there is no answer to this question. I mean, it depends on, you know, there, it's a very hard question to answer. So one way to think about this, there are too many entrepreneurs. The, the costs, we, social costs, the political, the economic costs, there are just too many people trying to do this. But on the other side, who's going to tell, who's going to be the person who says, okay, you, yes, you know. Now, in some European countries that used to do this, back 30, 40 years ago, if you wanted to start up, for example, a craft-based business in the Netherlands, you had to apply for a permit, and you had to be tested, and they had to decide that, you, that you, they needed you. Many European countries were like that. You had to actually get the Chamber of Commerce to sign off. You couldn't just start a business. So it was not quite as bad as the Soviet Union, but you know, as opposed to countries where, or countries like Peru, where you, go th you went through 10 years of paperwork to get started. We, we, in the U.S., it's not, uh, not that difficult. So the question is still going to be, okay, too many entrepreneurs. Somebody has to say who doesn't get to be an entrepreneur and who is going to be empowered to do that. On the other side, um, you could say, well, yeah, but what if somebody had told uh, Bill Gates, Bill, you should go back to Harvard. You, you know, that we, you, you should, it's too soon for you to start a company. You don't know enough yet. Go back to Harvard and finish your degree. Right? Or somebody had said to Steve Wozniak, and, and, and Steve Jobs said, you know, you guys, that's a crazy, that's a crazy idea. That garage, we could put a car in that garage. This is nuts. Why are you guys using that garage to start a business? So if, if somebody had done those things, the economic history would be different. And so the argument that the pro, the pro startup people make is that because we haven't, we're not clairvoyant, we may make a bad decision when we say to this person, you shouldn't. Do this, so we need. So it's it's because so many people are doing it blindly. That's what evolution is, right? Evolution is blind variation, blind with regard to to, to outcomes. So, so I don't know. I, there's no. I, I, somebody could weigh in on this. I'm I'm just responding. Pam, yeah. Actually, most people who start most people who start businesses aren't, aren't unemployed. Most people who start a business have a job. But I'm thinking of places. 
Oh, no, of Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 This is really about the developed nations. This is about Western Europe, North America, not Mexico. Yeah. I always had the assumption that the sort of late '80s, '90s sort of turn towards more intensively venerating entrepreneurship was linked to some some sea change in where money was being made. Because you know, it was a big shift in business schools, et cetera, from you know, the forwards of the world to the Microsoft. And, and I, so I was just asking whether there was, a, was empirically any, any support for, for, a, for a substantial I, source of that. Well, we a pretty big, I mean, it was always late. You can't, it doesn't. Yeah, the last 25 years, actually, proportionally, the, 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 the proportion of businesses being added to the economy has been going down the last 25 years. And, the, the, it's been, and within that, there's, a, there's been cyclical changes. So that after 2000, and, after, between 2000 and 2005, there were more births than deaths. And in 2008, it flipped. And it was amazing. You look at 2008, 2009, many more contractions and expansions, many more deaths than births. And so, although there's still births, right? That's the amazing thing. Even in the height of the recession, there are hundreds of thousands of people still trying this. I mean, it shows the incredible power of this idea and maybe the necessity, but there, it's not. It's not. There's no. There's no clear discontinuity. I don't. Well, I haven't seen any evidence for it. And this this picture here, you you can't really. You can't see it there. I mean, I I don't think. Um, not, none of the none of the data series. If you go if you go to the BLS website, go to look at BED. There's some great graphs there, and wonderful graphs, and you can download some of the stuff to play with. The BED data. Doesn't it's there's there's seasonal variation by quarters and there's there's big cycles but there's nothing like a sudden discontinuity with the, the Reagan years or the Bush years or the Clinton years. No, business schools have been adding uh, uh, chairs of entrepreneurship since the 70s and the, there was a big push to get business schools to create entrepreneurship programs in the 80s. I have a I think in fact wasn't one of my papers sent around the research policy paper. I have a paper that talks about the institutionalization of entrepreneurship as a field. And I go through all the indicators. And that's, those have been slowly increasing since the 70s. Uh, so, no, it's just been um, the momentum, I suppose, to institutionalize the field has picked up. With the creation of whether it was the AOM Entrepreneurship Division was created, entrepreneurship prizes, things like that. But as far as the people, or the humans and the population are concerned, I don't, I don't see any clear indication all of a sudden People one day woke up and said, "Wow, I've, what have I been missing?" You know, that doesn't doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah. Um, uh, when I find time, thank oh. you so thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.